Chapter Thirteen of A Coin of Edward the Seventh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Coin of Edward the Seventh by Fergus Hume. Chapter Thirteen. Mrs. Benker reappears. The more Giles thought about Franklin, the more he was certain that he was the man for whom search was being made. To be sure, there was no distinguishing mark of identification. The evidence that he was one and the same amounted to the facts that he had large black eyes, and that his height and figure resembled the so-called Wilson. Moreover, although other people in the village had seen the clerk, no one but Giles seemed to recognize him. In fact, this recognition was rather due to an instinct than to any tangible reason. But in his own mind he was convinced. He recalled how the man had suddenly removed his scarf as though he were stifling on that night. He remembered the wan face, the dark anxious face, and the rough red beard and hair. To be sure, Franklin was dark-haired and sallow in complexion. Also he was clean-shaved, and even when not, according to Mrs. Perry, had worn a full black beard but the red hair and whiskers might have been assumed as a disguise giles did know very well how to verify his suspicions then he determined to confide in morley steele had told him that the proprietor of the elms was an ex-detective and giles thought that for the sake of avenging daisy's death he might be induced to take up his old trade with this idea he called at the elms morley was delighted to see him and welcomed him in the most cheerful manner he and giles were always good friends and the only subject of contention between them was the question of anne's guilt morley still believed that the governess had committed the crime and asked after her at the outset of the interview have you found her he asked just as mrs perry had done giles knew quite well of whom he was speaking no i have not he answered and if i had i certainly should not tell you as you please replied the little man complacently you will never see the truth it is not the truth but see here morley what is the use of our discussing this matter you believe miss denham to be guilty i am certain that she is innocent let the difference between us rest there still if i could prove the innocence of miss denham i should be more than delighted responded morley quickly and would make all the amends in my power for my unjust suspicions but you have first to prove them unjust believe me ware i admired miss denham as much as my wife did and thought much of her i defended her from poor daisy's aspersions and would have stood her friend all through but for this last act of hers well well don't get angry i am willing to be shown that i am wrong show me giles reflected for a moment then went straight to the point i have been with steele he said abruptly and he tells me that you have been in the detective line yourself morley nodded quite so he answered although i asked steele to say nothing about it i am a private gentleman now and i don't want my former occupation to be known in rickwell a prejudice exists against detectives where people don't like them because every one has something to conceal and with a trained man he or she is afraid lest some secret sin should come to light it may be so although that is rather a cynical way of looking at the matter but you are really joe bart yes and quite at your service only keep this quiet certainly i quite appreciate your reasons for wanting the matter kept quiet but see here morley i shall call you so it will be better replied the ex-detective cheerfully and i have a sort of right to the name it was my mother's very good then as morley why should you not exercise your old skill and help me to find out who killed daisy i should be delighted and what skill remains to me is at your service but i am rusty now and cannot follow a trail with my old persistence or talent besides my mind is made up as to the guilt yes yes interposed giles hastily you think so but i don't agree with you 
now listen to what i have to tell you and i am sure you will think that it was the man who killed daisy but he had no motive yes he had i'll tell it to you concisely morley looked surprised at giles insistence but nodded without a word and waited for an explanation giles related all that he had learned about wilson and how steele had connected him with the supposed clerk who had served the summons on morley then he proceeded to detail steele's belief that the so-called wilson was a burglar and mentioned the fact of the yacht with the strange name morley listened in silence but interrupted the recital with a laugh when the scarlet cross was mentioned in connection with the robbery at lady summersdale's house steele has found a mare's nest this time he said coolly he knew better than to come to me with such a cock and bull story although he has imposed very successfully on you and on that hungarian princess you talk of i had the summersdale's case in hand i know steele said that you carried it through successfully morley demurred i don't know if you can say that i was successful where it was not one of my lucky cases i certainly got back the jewels i found them in their london hiding-place but i did not catch one of the thieves they all bolted in the red cross yacht oh that's all rubbish said morley frankly there were a great many yachts at bexley on that occasion i don't remember one called the red cross and even if one of that name was there it does not say that it is the same that was off gravesend the other day six months ago corrected giles gravely but how do you account for the fact that wherever that yacht has been burglaries have taken place i can't account for it and steele has yet to prove that there is any connection between the yacht and the robberies he thinks it a kind of pirate ship evidently not a bad idea though added morley musingly the goods could be removed easily without suspicion on board a good-looking yacht and that is what has been done it wasn't in the matter of lady summersdale's jewels retorted the ex-detective i found those in london and have reason to believe that they were taken there by train besides there was no connection between the yacht and that robbery steele said that a scarlet cross was found in the safe and-and interrupted morley there you have the long arm of coincidence where that cross belonged to lady summersdale and was one of the trinkets left behind if you want proof on this point you have only to ask lady no i forgot she is dead however i dare say her son or daughter will be able to prove that the cross was hers giles was much disappointed by this explanation which seemed clear enough and if any one should know the truth it would be the man who had taken charge of the case failing on this point giles shifted his ground well morley he said i am not very anxious to prove this man wilson a burglar he is a murderer i am sure and the greater crime swallows up the lesser that sounds law said morley lighting a cigar well ware i don't see how i can help you this man wilson whether he is innocent or guilty has vanished and moreover his connection if any with the summersdale robbery of ten years ago won't prove him guilty of my poor ward's death i only mentioned that to show his connection with the yacht at gravesend but as to this wilson i know where he is morley wheeled round with an eager light in his eyes the devil you do where is he at the priory is this a joke cried morley angrily if so it is a very poor one where the man who lives at the priory is my friend franklin he is also the man who was in the church on new year's eve the man who killed daisy as i truly believe giles went on to state what his reasons were for this belief all at once morley started to his feet ah i know now why something about him seems so familiar to me what a fool i am i believe you are right ware what that he is this man wilson i don't know what his former name was replied morley with a shrug 
but now you mention it i fancy he is the man who served the summons on me you ought to know said ware dryly you saw him in this room and in a good light true enough ware but all the time he kept his collar up and that white scarf round his throat his chin was quite buried in it and then he had a rough red wig shall we say and a red beard i didn't trouble to ask him to make himself comfortable all i wanted was to get him out of the way but i remember his black eyes franklin has eyes like that and sometimes i catch myself wondering where i have seen him before he tells me he has lived in florence these six years and more i fancied that when i was a detective i might have seen him but he insisted that he had not been to london for years and years he originally came from the states and i was once a detective good lord how i have lost my old cleverness but to be sure i have been idle these ten years then you think franklin is this man i think so but of course i can't be sure naturally he will deny that he is and i can't prove the matter myself but i tell you what ware said morley suddenly get that woman wilson lodged with down and see if she will recognize franklin as her former lodger she if any one will know him and perhaps throw him off his guard ware rose a very good idea he said i'll write to her at once i am certain this is the man especially as he has inherited daisy's money he killed her in order to get the fortune and that was why he kept asking asher's office-boy about money left to people ah morley looked thoughtful so that was the motive you think i am sure of it and a quite strong enough motive for many people said ware grimly if mrs benker can verify this man i'll have him arrested he will have to explain why he came here instead of the office-boy and why he fled on that night yes yes cried morley excitedly and he might perhaps explain why the governess helped him to escape ah giles face fell so he might but if he dares to inculpate her in this crime where said morley laying his hand on the young man's shoulder if i were you i should do nothing rash every one thinks that miss denham is guilty if this franklin is the man who fled with her he will accuse her to save himself certainly there is the motive of the money but that might be explained away i don't see how it can nor i still there is always the chance again he may take alarm always presuming he is the man and fly i tell you what ware you bring mrs benker down and take her into the grounds of the priory i will arrange that franklin without suspecting her or us shall meet her accidentally at some place where we can hide then we can overhear if he is the man or not he'll deny that he is why should he there is nothing so far as he knows that mrs benker can lay hold of if he is the man he will admit his identity if not he will explain who he is whereas if we show ourselves and show that we suspect him he will be on his guard nowhere better let the woman meet him by chance it's a good plan replied giles shaking hands heartily with morley i am delighted that you should cooperate with me we will yet prove that anne is innocent i hope so cried his host slapping giles on the back off with you ware do your part i'll attend to franklin but say no word of our plan to any one upon my word cried he jubilantly i feel just as though i were in the profession again and thus laughing and joking he sent his visitor away in the best of spirits delighted that he had some one to help him giles lost no time in performing his part of the business he sent a letter to mrs benker asking her to come down for a couple of days it was his intention to invite alexander also 
as the boy would also be useful in identifying franklin as his mother's former lodger but since leaving ashers alexander had been taken up by steele who saw in him the makings of a good detective if alexander learned anything he would certainly tell his master and then steele would come down to interfere ware did not want him to meddle with the matter at present he wished to be sure of his ground first and then would ask the assistance of the detective to have franklin arrested of course he had every confidence in steele but for the above reason he determined to keep his present action quiet also steele was on the south coast hunting for evidence concerning the red cross yacht and would not be pleased at being taken away to follow what might prove to be a false trail ware therefore said nothing to mrs banker about what he desired to see her but simply asked her to come down on a visit there was a prospect of his having another visitor and one he did not much wish to meet this was the princess caraxe several times he had called to see her but she had always put off her promised explanation on some plea or another instead of attending strictly to the business which had brought them together she made herself agreeable to giles too agreeable he thought for he had by this time got it into his head that olga caraxe was in love with him he was not a vain young man and tried to think that her attentions were merely friendly but she was so persistent in her invitations and in the slang phrase made such running with him that he grew rather nervous of her attentions several times she had proposed to come on a visit to rickwell but hitherto he had always managed to put her off but her letters were becoming very imperative and he foresaw trouble it was quite a relief to giles when the post arrived without a letter from this too persistent and too charming lady however she did not trouble him on this especial occasion and he was thus enabled to give all his time to mrs Menker. the good lady duly arrived looking more severe than ever and with several new tales about the iniquities of alexander she expressed herself greatly obliged to giles for giving her a day in the country and got on very well with the old housekeeper but when ware told her his reason for asking her mrs Menker grew rather nervous as she did not think how she could support an interview and also she wanted to know what the interview was for to some extent giles had to take her into his confidence but he suppressed the fact that he suspected franklin of the crime he merely stated that steele who had introduced giles to mrs Benker, had reason to believe that the so-called wilson was wanted by the police all that mrs Benker had to do was to see if franklin was really her former lodger after much talk and many objections she consented to do what was wanted this was to wander in the park of the priory and meet franklin accidentally near a ruined summer-house near what was known as the fish-ponds morley had arranged that franklin should meet him there and was to be late so as to afford mrs Benker an opportunity of speaking to the man morley and ware concealed themselves in the summer-house and saw mrs Benker parading the grass shortly franklin arrived walking slowly and mrs Benker saluted him end of chapter thirteen read by celine major chapter fourteen of a coin of edward the seventh this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a coin of edward the seventh by fergus hume chapter fourteen treasure trove i beg your pardon sir said mrs Benker to the newcomer but i do hope i'm not why she changed her tone to one of extreme surprise if it ain't mr wilson the man did not move a muscle ware who was watching was disappointed at least he expected him to start but the so-called wilson was absolutely calm and his voice did not falter you are making a mistake my name is franklin it isn't his voice muttered the landlady still staring but his eyes are the same may i ask you to go said franklin you are trespassing 
mrs banker shook her rusty black bonnet you may change your hair from red to black she declared and you may shave off a ginger beard but you can't alter your eyes mr wilson you are and that i'll swear to in a court of law before a judge and jury let them say what they will about me being a liar of what are you talking woman of you sir and i hope i may mention that you were more respectful when you boarded with me boarded with you franklin stared and spoke in an astonished tone why i never boarded with you in my life oh mr wilson how can you what about my little house in lambeth and the dear boy my son alexander you were so fond of you are raving i'm as sane as you are said the landlady her colour rising and a deal more respectable if all were known why you should deny me to my face is more than i can make out mr wilson my name is not wilson and i say it is sir both the man and the woman eyed one another firmly then franklin motioned mrs benker to a seat on a mossy bank we can talk better sitting said he i should like an explanation of this you say that my name is wilson and that i boarded with you at lambeth i'll take my oath to it had your boarder red hair and a red beard red as a tomato but you can buy wigs and false beards eyes as i say you cannot change had this wilson eyes like mine asked franklin eagerly there ain't a scrap of difference mr wilson your eyes are the same now as they were then one moment had this man you think me to be two teeth missing in his lower jaw two front teeth he had not that his teeth were of the best franklin drew down his lip you will see that i have all my teeth hm mrs banker sniffed paul's teeth can be bought i fear you would find these teeth only too genuine said the man quietly but i quite understand your mistake my mistake mrs banker shook her head vehemently i'm not one to make mistakes on this occasion you have done so but the mistake is pardonable mrs mrs what is your name mrs banker sir and you know it excuse me i do not know it the man who was your lodger and whom you accuse me of being is my brother your brother echoed the landlady amazed yes and a bad lot he is never did a hand's turn in all his life i dare say while he was with you he kept the most irregular hours he did most irregular out all night at times and in all day and again out all day and in for the night you describe him exactly mrs banker peered into the clean-shaven face in a puzzled manner your hair is black your voice is changed and only the eyes remain my brother and i have eyes exactly the same i guessed your mistake when you spoke i assure you i am not my brother well sir said the woman beginning to think she had made a mistake after all i will say your voice is not like his it was low and soft while yours if you'll excuse me mentioning it is hard and not at all what i call a love voice grim as franklin was he could not help laughing at this last remark i quite understand you only confirm what i say my brother has a beautiful voice mrs banker and much harm he has done with it amongst your sex he never harmed me said mrs banker bridling i am a respectable woman and a widow with one son but your brother he's a blackguard interrupted franklin hand and glove with the very worst people in london you may be thankful he did not cut your throat or steal your furniture lord cried mrs banker astounded was he that dangerous he is so dangerous that he ought to be shut up and if i could lay hands on him i'd get the police to shut him up he's done no end of mischief now i dare say he had a red cross dangling from his watch-chain yes he had what does it mean i can't tell you 
but i'd give a good deal to know he has hinted to me that it is the sign of some criminal fraternity with which he is associated i never could learn what the object of the cross is he always kept quiet on that subject but i have not seen him for years and then only when i was on a flying visit from italy have you been to italy sir i live there said franklin at florence i have lived there for over ten years with an occasional visit to london if you still think that i am my brother i can bring witnesses to prove lord sir i don't want to prove nothing now i look at you and hear your voice i do say as i made a mistake as i humbly beg your pardon for but you are so like mr wilson i know and i forgive you but why do you wish to find my brother he has been up to some rascality i suppose he has though what it is i know no more than a babe but they do say added mrs benker sinking her voice as the police want him i'm not at all astonished he has placed himself within the reach of the law a hundred times if the police come to me i'll tell them what i have told you no one would be more pleased than i to see walter laid by the heels is his name walter yes walter franklin although he chooses to call himself wilson my name is george he is a blackguard oh sir you're flesh and blood he's no brother of mine said franklin rising with a snarl i hate the man he had traded on his resemblance to me to get money and do all manner of scoundrelly actions that was why i went to italy it seems that i did wisely for i could not prove that i have been abroad these ten years you would swear that i was walter oh no sir really mrs benker rose also nonsense you swore that i was walter when we first met take a good look at me now so that you may be sure that i am not he i don't want to have his rascalities placed on my shoulders mrs benker took a good look and sighed you're not him but you're very like may i ask if you are twins sir no our eyes are the only things that we have in common we got those from our mother who was an italian i take after my mother and am black as you see me my brother favoured my father who was as red as an autumn sunset he was indeed red sighed mrs benker wrapping her shawl round her and now sir i hope you'll humbly forgive me for that's all right mrs benker i only explained myself at length because i am so sick of having my brother's sins imputed on me i hope he paid your rent oh yes sir he did that regularly indeed sneered franklin then he is more honest than i gave him credit for being because if he had not paid you i should have done so you seem to be a decent woman and a widow murmured mrs benker hoping that he would give her some money but this mr franklin had no intention of doing you can go now he said pointing with his stick towards an ornamental bridge that is the best way to the high road and mrs benker if my brother should return to you let me know and the police sir she faltered i'll tell the police myself said the man frowning good day mrs benker rather disappointed that she should have received no money and wishing that she had said walter franklin had not paid her rent crept off a lugubrious figure across the bridge franklin watched her till she was out of sight then took off his hat exposing a high baldish head his face was dark and he began to mutter to himself finally he spoke articulately am i never to be rid of that scamp he said shaking his fist at the sky i have lived in italy in exile so that i should not be troubled with his schemes and rascalities i have buried myself here with my daughter and those three who are faithful to me in order that he may not find me out and now i hear of him that woman she is a spy of his i believe she came here from him with a made-up story walter will come and then i'll have to buy him off i shall be glad to do so but to be blackmailed by that reptile no 
i'll go back to florence first he replaced his hat and began to dig his stick in the ground i wonder if morley would help me he is a shrewd man he might advise me how to deal with this wretched brother of mine if i could only trust him he looked around i wonder where he is he promised to meet me half an hour ago here franklin glanced at his watch i'll walk over to the elms and ask who this woman mrs benker is he may know all this was delivered audibly and at intervals giles was not astonished as he knew from mrs perry that the man was in the habit of talking aloud to himself but he was disappointed to receive such a clear proof that franklin was not the man who had eloped with anne even if he had been deceiving mrs benker which was not to be thought of he would scarcely have spoken in soliloquy as he did if he had not been the man he asserted himself to be giles saying nothing to his companion watched franklin in silence until he was out of sight and then rose to stretch his long legs morley with a groan followed his example it was he who spoke first i am half dead with the cramp said he rubbing his stout leg just like old times when i hid in a cupboard at mother medler's to hear black bill give himself away over a burglary ay and i nearly sneezed that time which would have cost me my life i have been safe enough in that summer-house but the cramp ouch it seems i have been mistaken was all giles could say so have i so was mrs benker we are all in the same box the man is evidently very like his scamp of a brother no doubt morley but he isn't the brother himself more's the pity for franklin's sake as well as our own he seems to hate his brother fairly and would be willing to give him up to the law if he's done anything well said ware beginning to walk this walter franklin to give him his real name has committed murder i am more convinced than ever that he is the guilty person but i don't see what he has to do with anne her father is certainly dead died at florence ha morley franklin comes from florence he may know he may have heard morley nodded you're quite right ware i'll ask him about the matter Hum. the ex-detective stopped for a moment this involuntary confession clears george franklin yes he is innocent enough well but he inherited the money said morley it's queer that his brother according to you should have killed the girl who kept the fortune from him it is strange but it might be that walter franklin intended to play the part of his brother and get the money counting on the resemblance between them that's true enough but if george were in italy and within hail so to speak i don't see how that would have done why not come to the elms with me and speak to franklin yourself he will be waiting for me there no answered ware after some thought he evidently intends to trust you and if i come he may hold his tongue you draw him out morley and then you can tell me mrs benker i'll say nothing about her i'm not supposed to know that she is a visitor to rickwell he'll suspect our game if i chatter about her where we must be cautious this is a difficult skein to unravel it is that assented giles dolefully and we're no further on with it than we were before nonsense man we have found out wilson's real name well that is something certainly and his brother may be able to put us on his track if he asks about mrs benker say that she is a friend of my housekeeper you can say you heard it from your wife i'll say no more than is necessary replied morley cunningly i learned in my detective days to keep a shut mouth well i'll be off and see what i can get out of him when morley departed at his fast little trot he got over the ground quickly for so small a man giles wandered about the priory park he thought that he might meet with the daughter and see what kind of a person she was if weak in the head as mrs perry declared her to be she might chatter about her uncle walter 
giles wished to find out all he could about that scamp he was beginning to feel afraid for anne and to wonder in what way she was connected with such a blackguard however he saw nothing and turned his face homeward just as he was leaving the park on the side near the cemetery he saw something glittering in the grass this he picked up and was so amazed that he could only stare at it dumbfounded and his astonishment was little to be wondered at he held in his hand a half-sovereign with an amethyst a diamond and a pearl set into the gold it was the very ornament which he had given anne denham on the night of the children's party at the elms the coin of his most gracious majesty king edward the seventh end of chapter fourteen read by celine major chapter fifteen of a coin of edward the seventh this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a coin of edward the seventh by fergus hume chapter fifteen an awkward interview the discovery of the coin perplexed giles it was certainly the trinket attached to the bangle which he had given anne and here he found it in the grounds of the priory this would argue that she was in the neighbourhood in the house it might be she had never been to the priory when living at the elms certainly not after the new year when she first became possessed of the coin he decided therefore that at some late period within the last few days she had been in the park and there had lost the coin it would indeed be strange if this trifling present which he had made her should be the means of tracing her to her hiding-place and that hiding-place was the priory giles felt sure of this if she was in the neighbourhood and walking about openly she would be discovered and arrested therefore she must be concealed in the house she had gone off with walter franklin and here she was under the wing of his brother george the case grew more mysterious and perplexing as time went on giles did not know which way to turn or what advantage to reap from this discovery certainly if he could get into the priory and search the house he might discover anne or it might be that if he confided in franklin and told him of his love for anne the man might tell the truth and let him have an interview but the matter took some thinking out he decided to let it remain in abeyance at present after kissing the coin had it not been anne's he slipped it into his waistcoat pocket and returned home here a surprise and not a very agreeable one awaited him he reached his house just in time to dress for dinner and found a letter which had been delivered by hand it was from olga Karaxay and announced that she and her mother were stopping at the village inn she asked giles to come over that evening as she wished to introduce him to the elder princess ware was vexed that this inopportune visit should have taken place at the moment he did not wish to be introduced to olga's mother and had more to do than to chatter french to a foreign lady however being naturally a most polite young gentleman he could not refuse the request and after dinner proceeded to the village morris the landlord of the merry dancer which was the name of the inn was a burly man and usually extremely self-important on this night he excelled himself and looked as swollen as the frog in the fable that two princesses should stay in his house was an honour which overwhelmed him to be sure they were foreigners which made a difference still they had titles and plenty of money and for all morris knew as he observed to his flustered wife might be exiled sovereigns morris received giles in his best clothes and bowed himself to the ground yes mr ware their highnesses are within on the first floor mr ware having engaged a salon and two bedrooms i didn't know you had a salon morris said giles his eyes twinkling for the time being i call it such replied the landlord grandly my daughter is a french scholar mr ware and called the sitting-room by that name me and mrs morris and henrietta morris wish to make their highnesses feel at home allow me to conduct you sir to the salon of their highnesses the garcong is engaged with the june along with the famille de chambers who also waits 
you are a french scholar morris henrietta morris my daughter or i should say mon fille has instructed me in the language sir this way to the salon sir and morris marshalled the way with the air of a courtier of louis the fourteenth giles entered the sitting-room which was pretty and quaint but extremely unpretentious bubbling over with laughter olga came forward and catching sight of his face laughed also as she shook hands with him i see you know the jest she said morris informed me of it as soon as i entered his door why have you come down to this dull place princess ah no she made a pretty gesture of annoyance you must to-night call me olga i should not think of taking such a liberty said giles quickly olga pouted then mademoiselle olga said she my mother you must call the princess caraxay will you allow me mr ware to present you to my mother she led the young man forward and he found himself bowing to a stout lady who at one time must have been beautiful but in whom age had destroyed a great amount of her good looks she was darker than her daughter and had a languid indolent air which seemed to account for her stoutness evidently she never took exercise her face was still beautiful and she had the most glorious pair of dark eyes her hair was silvery and contrasted strangely with her swart face one would have thought that she had african blood in her she wore a yellow dress trimmed with black lace and many jewels twinkled on her neck and arms and in her hair her tastes like her appearance were evidently barbaric in this cold misty island she looked like some gorgeous tropical bird astray i am glad to see you mr ware she said in soft languid tones yet with a kind of rough burr my daughter has often talked of you her english was very good and there was little trace of foreign accent yet the occasional lisp and the frequent roughness added a piquancy to her tones even at her age and she was considerably over fifty she was undeniably a fascinating woman in her youth she must have been a goddess both for looks and charm olga was regal and charming but her mother excelled her giles found himself becoming quite enchanted with this cleopatra of the west you have been long in england princess he asked but a week i came to see olga she would have me come although i dislike travelling but i am fond of olga it is more than my father is said olga with a shrug he would not come i suppose he thinks that i have disgraced him my dear child reproved her mother you know what your father's opinion is about this wild life you lead a very hard working life retorted her daughter singing is not easy for the rest i assure you i am respectable it is not the life for a caraxay my dear if you would only come back to vienna and marry the man your father i choose for myself when i marry flashed out olga with a glance at the uncomfortable giles count tarok can take another wife the princess seeing that giles found this conversation somewhat trying refrained from further remark she shrugged her ample shoulders and sipped her coffee which she complained was bad you do not know how to make coffee here she said unfurling a fan and it is cold this england of yours princess to-night is warm expostulated ware nevertheless i have had a fire made up she answered pointing with her fan to the end of the room the landlord was so surprised he no doubt considered it to be an eccentricity of her highness said olga with a laugh a cigarette mother the princess took one languidly and moved her chair closer to the fire the night to giles was quite hot and he could scarcely bear the stifling heat of the room windows and doors were closed and the fire flamed up fiercely also some pastilles had been burnt by olga and added a heavy sensuous scent to the atmosphere ware could not help comparing the room to the venusberg and the women to the sirens of that unholy haunt which of the two was venus he did not take upon himself to decide i am used to the tropics exclaimed the princess puffing blue clouds of smoke i come from jamaica 
but i have been many years in vienna and in that cold hungary she shivered and now i see princess why you speak english so well said giles and he might also have added that he now guessed why she was so eastern in appearance and so barbaric in her taste for crude vivid colors she had negro blood in her veins he decided and olga also this would account for the fierce temperament of the latter i left jamaica when i was twenty-two exclaimed the princess while her daughter frowned for some reason olga did not seem to approve of these confidences prince karakse was travelling there he came to my father's plantation and there he married me i am sorry i did not marry someone in jamaica she finished lazily my dear mother broke in her daughter petulantly you have always been happy in vienna and at the castle at the castle yes it was so quiet there but vienna ah it is too gay too troublesome you don't like noise and excitement princess she shook her imperial head with the gesture of an angry queen i like nothing but rest to be in a hammock with a cigarette and to hear the wind bend the palms the surf break on the shores it is my heaven but in hungary no palms no surf ah she made a face you are different to mademoiselle olga here said ware smiling quite different cried olga with a gay laugh but i am like my father he is a bold hunter and rider ah if i had only been born a man i love the saddle and the gun no wonder i got away from the dull society life of vienna where women are slaves i like being a slave if rest is slavery murmured her mother would not your father let you ride and shoot mademoiselle olga oh yes in a measure but he is an austrian of the old school he does not believe in a woman being independent my mother who is obedient and good is the wife he loves the prince has been very kind to me he does not trouble me he wouldn't let the air blow too roughly on you mother said olga with a scornful laugh he is a descendant of those magyars who had circassian slaves and adores them as playthings i am different you are terribly farouche olga sighed the older woman your father has forgiven you but he is still annoyed i had the greatest difficulty in getting his permission to come over here he doubtless thinks you will be able to bring me back to marry count tarok replied olga composedly but i stay she looked at giles again as if he were the reason she thus decided to change the conversation he stood up i fear i fatigue you ladies he said looking very straight and handsome you will wish to retire certainly i retire said the princess but my daughter i shall stop and talk with mr ware olga murmured her mother rather shocked i fear i have to go said giles uneasily no you must stop i have to talk to you about anne who is this anne asked the princess rising lazily no one you know mother a friend of mr ware's now you must retire and katinka shall make you comfortable you will not be long olga if your father knew my father will not know broke in her daughter leading the elder woman to the door you will not tell him besides she shrugged we women are free in england what would shock my father is good form in this delightful country the princess murmured something to giles in a sleepy tone and lounged out of the room bulky but graceful when she departed and the door was closed olga threw open the windows pa she said throwing the pastilles out of the door i cannot breathe in this atmosphere and you mr ware i prefer untainted airs he replied accepting a cigarette the airs of the moors and of the mountains she exclaimed drawing herself up and looking like a huntress in her free grace i also i love wide spaces and chill winds if we were in the carpathians you and i how savage our life would be an alluring picture princess i am not princess at present i am olga mademoiselle olga he corrected and what about anne 
she appeared annoyed by his persistence you think of nothing but that woman she cried impetuously your friend mademoiselle ah how stiffly you say that my friend oh yes i would do much for anne but why should i do all i do not understand mademoiselle with a strong effort she composed herself and looked at him smiling is it so very difficult to understand she asked softly very difficult replied ware stolidly none so blind as those who won't see muttered olga savagely quite so mademoiselle he rose to go will you permit me to retire no i have much to say to you please sit down if you will talk about anne he replied still standing from what you said at our first interview she evidently knows something of the scarlet cross and i don't know what she does know she was always careful i thought she spoke freely to you oh as a woman always does speak to one of her own sex with reservations mr ware still i could tell you something likely to throw some light on the mystery if you only would it would not lead you to her hiding-place what if i knew it already mademoiselle she stood before him her hands clenched her breathing coming and going in quick short gasps you can't know that but you do he said suddenly i may or i may not she replied quickly and if you know why not seek her out i intend to try to try then you are not sure where she is said olga eagerly before i answer that mademoiselle i must know if you are my friend or anne's enemy and he looked at her straightly you have put the matter the position in the right way i am your friend and anne's no i am not her enemy but i won't give her to you no i won't you must guess that i mademoiselle he interrupted quickly spare yourself and me unnecessary humiliation you know that i love anne that i love no one but her i would give my life to find her to prove her innocence even your life will not bring her to you or save her from the law giles she held out her arms i love you the heat of the room is too much for you i will go no she flung herself between him and the door since i have said so much i must say all listen i have been making inquiries i know more about the scarlet cross and anne's connection with it than you think her fate is in my hands i can prove her innocence and you will you will on condition that you give her up i refuse to give her up he cried angrily then she will be punished for a crime she did not commit you know that she is innocent i can prove it and i shall do so you know my price olga do not speak like this i would do much to save anne and you refuse to save her she replied scornfully i refuse to give her up then i shall do so to the police i know where she is you do that is why you are down here i did not come here for that but to see you to make my terms i love you and if you will give her up i shall save her i can save her in spite of you said giles walking hastily in the door your presence here confirms a fancy that i had i can guess where anne is and i'll save her you will bring her to the light of day and she will be arrested i alone can save her you will oh olga be your better self and you know my price she said between her teeth i can't pay it i can't then you must be content to see her ruined you are a devil and you are most polite no i am a woman who loves you and who is determined to have you at any cost can you really say van i can will you give me time to think a flash of joy crossed her face then i am not so indifferent to you as you would have me suppose she said softly you are not so no no i can't say it give me time give me time 
he opened the door wait wait she said and closed it again i will give you two days then i return to london if i have your promise and shall be set free from this accusation if you tamper in the meantime with her for you may know where she is i'll have her arrested at once i will do nothing he said in muffled tones swear swear she placed her hands on his shoulders giles stepped back to free himself i will swear nothing he said in icy tones i take my two days so saying he opened the door but not quickly enough to prevent her kissing him you are mine you are mine she exclaimed exultingly let anne have her liberty her good name i have you you are mine mine on conditions said giles cruelly and went away quickly End of chapter fifteen read by celine major chapter sixteen of a coin of edward the seventh this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a coin of edward the seventh by fergus hume chapter sixteen the unexpected happens giles left the merry dancer quite determined to deceive olga if it were possible no faith should be kept with such a woman she had power and she was using it unscrupulously for selfish ends moreover come what might giles could not bring himself to make her his wife he loved anne too deeply for that and then he began to ask himself if he were not selfish also seeing that he would not lose his own gratification to save the woman he loved nevertheless he could not contemplate giving up anne with equanimity and set his wits to work in order to circumvent the treacherous olga in the first place he now felt certain that anne was in the neighbourhood and as he shrewdly suspected in the priory the discovery of the coin and the presence of olga in the village made him certain on this point in some way or another she had got to know of anne's whereabouts and had come here to make capital of her knowledge if he consented to surrender anne and make olga his wife she would probably assist anne to escape or else as she asserted clear her of complicity in the crime on the other hand should he refuse she would then tell the police where the unfortunate governess was to be found it might be that anne could save herself but seeing that she had fled immediately after the murder it would be difficult for her to exonerate herself also the reason she had then to take the guilt upon her own shoulders might again stand in the way of her now clearing her character nothing was left but to marry olga and so free anne or seek anne himself where determined to adopt the latter course as the least repugnant to his feelings but olga was no mean antagonist she loved giles so much that she knew perfectly well that he did not love her and this knowledge taught her to mistrust him as her passion was so great she was content to take him as a reluctant husband in the belief that she as his wife would in time wean him from his earlier love but she was well aware that even to save anne he would not give in without a struggle this being the case she considered what he would do it struck her that he would see if he could get into the priory for from some words he had let fall she was convinced that he thought anne was concealed therein olga had her own opinion about that but she had to do with his actions at present and not with her own thoughts for this reason she determined to watch him to be in his company throughout the time of probation thus it happened that before giles could arrange his plans the next day one of which entailed a neighbourly visit to franklin olga made her appearance at his house and expressed a desire to see his picture gallery of which she had heard much her mother she said was coming over that afternoon to look at the house which as she had been told was a model of what an english country house should be giles growled at this speech being clever enough to see through the artifices of mademoiselle olga the house is as old as the tudors he expostulated your mother should look at a more modern one oh no replied olga sweetly i am sure she will be delighted with this one it is so picturesque i am afraid that i promised to pay a visit this afternoon 
ah you must put it off mr ware when two ladies come to see you you really cannot leave them alone if the next day will do i don't think it will my mother and i leave the next day she is due in town to a reception at the austrian embassy ware made other excuses but olga would listen to none of them she stopped all the morning and looked at the pictures but she never referred to their conversation of the previous night there was a tacit understanding between them that it should remain in abeyance until the time given for the reply of giles was ended still ware could not forget that burning kiss and was awkward in consequence not so olga she was cool and self-possessed and although alone with him for close on two hours did not show the least confusion giles much disgusted called her in his own mind unmaidenly but she was not that for she behaved very discreetly she was simply a woman deeply in love who was bent on gaining her ends considering the depth of her passion she restrained herself very creditably when with the man she loved giles now saw how it was that she had defied her family and had taken her own way in life i won't stop to luncheon she said when he asked her but i and my mother will come over at three o'clock it was now close on two i am sure we shall have a pleasant afternoon giles tried to smile and succeeded very well considering what his feelings were at the moment if he could only have behaved brutally he would have refused the honour of the proposed visit but it is difficult to be rude to a charming woman bent upon having her own way ware kicked as a man will but ended in accepting the inevitable olga returned to the inn and found the princess seated on the sofa fanning herself violently mrs morris was in the room fluttering nervously as she laid the cloth for luncheon olga looked at her mother did you take your walk she asked the princess nodded i am very warm she said what do you think now asked her daughter impatiently i think that you are a very clever woman olga replied the princess but i am too hungry to talk just now when i have eaten and am rested we can speak but just one word am i right perfectly right this conversation was conducted in french and mrs morris could make nothing of it even if she had known the sense she would not have understood what it meant however olga and her mother reverted to english for the benefit of the landlady and chatted about their proposed visit to ware's mansion after that came luncheon shortly after three mother and daughter were with giles he received them with composure although he felt quite otherwise than composed the princess pronounced him a charming young man and what a delightful place you have here she said looking at the quaint tudor house with its grey walls and mullion windows it is like a fairy palace the castle she meant her husband's residence in styria is cruel-looking and wild it was built in the middle ages said olga i don't think any one was particularly amiable then i would rather have stayed in jamaica sighed the princess why did i ever leave it olga who always appeared annoyed when her mother reverted to her early life touched the elder woman's elbow the princess sighed again and held her peace she had a fine temper of her own but always felt that it was an effort to use it she therefore usually gave in to olga it saved trouble she explained but her good temper did not last all the afternoon and ended in disarranging olga's plans after a hearty afternoon tea on the lawn the princess said that she did not feel well and wished to go home olga demurred but giles seeing the chance of escape agreed that the princess really was unwell and proposed to send them back to the inn in his carriage princess caraxay jumped at the offer it will save me walking she declared fretfully and i have done so much this morning where did you go asked giles wondering that so indolent a woman should exert herself on such a hot day to some woods round a place they call the priory to the priory he exclaimed astonished do you know mr franklin my mother said the woods round the priory explained olga with an annoyed glance at the elder lady she did not enter no 
said the princess i did not enter i do not know the man oh my dear olga do come back i don't feel at all well i will order the carriage said giles rising and you will come back with us really you must excuse me mademoiselle olga he answered but even a country squire has his work to do and with that he hurried away in half an hour he had the satisfaction of seeing the carriage roll down his avenue with a very disappointed young lady frowning at the broad back of the coachman then he set about seeing what he could do to circumvent her it was too late to call on franklin as it was nearly six o'clock still ware thought he would reconnoiter in the woods it was strange that the elder princess should have been there this morning and he wondered if she also knew of anne's whereabouts but this he decided was impossible she had only been a few days in england and she would not likely know anything about the governess still it was odd that she should have taken a walk in that particular direction or that she should have walked at all here was another mystery added to the one which already perplexed him so greatly however time was too precious to be wasted in soliloquizing so he went off post haste towards the woods round the priory since he wished to avoid observation he chose by-paths and took a rather circuitous route it was nearly seven when he found himself in the forest the summer evenings were then at their longest and under the great trees there was a soft brooding twilight full of peace and pleasant woodland sounds had he gone straight forward he would have come on the great house itself centred in that fairy forest but this was the last thing he wished to do he was not yet prepared to see franklin he looked here and there to see if any human being was about but unsuccessfully then he took his way to the spot where he had found the coin of edward the seventh to his surprise he saw a girl stooping and searching at once he decided that she was looking for the lost coin but the girl was not anne looking up suddenly she surveyed him with a startled air and he saw her face plainly in the quiet evening light she had reddish hair a freckled face and was dressed as mrs perry had said in all the colours of the rainbow giles guessed at once who she was and bowed good evening miss franklin he said lifting his hat you seem to be looking for something can i assist you the damsel looked at him sternly and scowled you're trespassing she said in a rather gruff voice i fear that i am he answered laughing but you'll forgive me if i assist you in your search won't you who are you questioned miss franklin quite unmoved by this politeness i never saw you before i have just returned from london my name is ware ware echoed the girl eagerly giles ware yes do you know my name she took a good look at him and seemed he was vain enough to think so rather to soften towards him i have heard mrs morley speak of you she declared bluntly ah you have not heard a lady speak of me miss franklin stared no i never heard a lady talk of you she replied with a giggle what lady the lady who is stopping in your house her eyes became hard and she assumed a stony expression there is no lady in the house but myself not a lady who lost what you are looking for this time she was thrown off her guard and became as red as her hair she tried to carry off her confusion with rudeness i don't know what you're talking of she said with a stamp and a frown you can just clear off our land or i'll set the dogs on you i see you keep dogs do you bloodhounds probably how do you know that asked miss franklin staring yes we do keep bloodhounds and they will tear you to pieces if you don't go you seem to forget that this is a civilized country said giles quietly if you set your dogs on me i shall set the police on you the police she seemed startled but recovered herself i don't care for the police she declared defiantly you might not but walter franklin might who is he never heard of him never heard of your uncle said giles and then wondered how he could let her know that he had heard it without confessing to the eavesdropping it suddenly occurred to him that franklin had he supposed on the previous day made a confidant of morley this supposition he took advantage of mr morley told me that your father had mentioned his brother 
the girl started and thought for a moment oh you mean uncle walter she said after a pause yes but we never talk of him this little speech did not ring quite true it seemed as though the girl wished to back up the saying of her father whether she believed it or not is that why you pretended ignorance he asked that was why replied miss franklin with brazen assurance she was lying giles felt certain of that but he could not bring the untruth home to her he suddenly reverted to the main object of his interview which had to do with the possibility of anne being in the priory what about that coin you are looking for i am looking for no coin she replied quite prepared for him i lost a brooch here have you found it yes replied giles his eyes watchfully on her face it is an edward the seventh coin in the form of a brooch he thought miss franklin would contradict this but she was perfectly equal to the occasion you must have found it since you know it so well please give it to me i have left it at home he answered although it was lying in his pocket-book and that next to his heart i will give it to you to-morrow if you tell me from whom you got it i found it she confessed in the churchyard ah a sudden light flashed into the darkness of ware's mind by the grave of that poor girl who was murdered i don't know of any murdered girl retorted miss franklin and looked uneasy as though she were conscious of making a mistake yes you do and you know the lady who cleans the stone and attends to the grave don't deny the truth miss franklin looked him up and down and shrugged her clumsy shoulders i don't know what you are talking about she declared and with that turned on her heel since you will not take yourself off like a gentleman i'll go myself and she went don't set the bloodhounds on me called out giles but she never turned her head simply went on with a steady step until she was lost in the gloom of the wood giles waited for a time he had an idea that she was watching by and by the feeling wore off and knowing by this time that he was quite alone he also departed he was beginning to doubt franklin for this girl had evidently something to conceal he was sure that anne was being sheltered in the house and that it was anne who cleaned the gravestone perhaps george franklin was giving her shelter since she had helped his rascal of her brother to escape thus thinking he went through the wood with the intention of going home a glance at his watch told him it was after eight suddenly it occurred to him that it would be a good time to pay a visit to the graveyard and see if anything new had been done to the grave all the people were within doors at this hour and the churchyard would be quiet having made up his mind he walked in the direction of the church and vaulted the low wall that divided that graveyard from the park he saw daisy's grave bending over it a woman she looked up with a startled cry it was anne denham end of chapter 16 read by celine major chapter 17 of a coin of edward the 7th this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a coin of edward the seventh by fergus hume chapter seventeen part of the truth for a moment the lovers stared at one another in the luminous twilight the meeting was so strange the place where it took place so significant of the trouble that had parted them that both were overcome with emotion anne was as white as the marble tombstone and looked at him with appealing eyes that beseeched him to go away but having found her giles was determined not to lose her again and was the first to find his tongue anne said he and stepped towards her with open arms his voice broke the spell which held her chain to the ill-omened spot and she turned to fly only to find herself on his breast and his dear voice sounding entreatingly in her ears anne he said in a hoarse whisper you will not leave me now after a brief struggle she surrendered herself there was no danger of any one coming to the churchyard at this hour and since they had met so unexpectedly she like the tender sweet woman she was snatched at the blissful moment giles she murmured and it was the first time she had heard her lips frame his name giles 
again there was a silence between them but one of pure joy and transcendental happiness come what might nothing could banish the memory of that moment they were heart to heart and each knew that the other loved there was no need of words giles felt that here was the woman for him and anne nestled in those beloved arms like a wild bird sheltering from the storm but the storm which buffeted her wings would tear her from this refuge the passionate delight of that second of eden passed like a shadow on the sundial from heaven they dropped to earth and parted once more by a hand breath stared with haggard looks at one another the revulsion was so great that anne could have wept but her sorrow was so deep that her eyes were dry for the gift of the world she could not have wept at that hour but she no longer felt an inclination to fly when she saw how worn and thin her lover looked she knew that he had been suffering as much as she had and a full tide of love swelled to her heart she also had lost much of her beauty but she never thought of that all she desired was to comfort the man that loved her she felt that an explanation was due to him and this she determined to give as far as she could without incriminating others taking his hand in her own she led him some little distance from the grave of daisy and they seated themselves on a flat stone in the shadow of the church and a stone's throw from the park wall here they could converse without being seen and if any one came they could hear the footsteps on the gravelled path and so be warned and throughout that short interview anne listened with strained attention for the coming step at the outset giles noted her expectant look and put his arm round her dearest do not fear he said softly no one will come and if any one does i can save you no she replied turning her weary eyes on him i am under a ban i am a fugitive from the law you cannot save me from that but you are innocent he said vehemently do you believe that i am giles do i believe it why should you ask me such a question if you only knew anne i have never doubted you from the first never never i do know it she said throwing her arms around his neck i have known all along how you believed in my innocence oh giles my darling giles how shall i be able to thank you for this trust you can anne by becoming my wife would you marry me with this accusation hanging over me i would make you my wife at this moment i would stand beside you in the dock holding your hand what does it matter to me if all the foolish world think you guilty i know in my own heart that you are an innocent woman oh giles giles then her tears burst forth she could weep now and felt the better for that moment of joyful relief he waited till she grew more composed and then began to talk of the future this can't go on for ever anne said he decisively you must proclaim your innocence i can't she answered with hanging head i understand you wish to protect this man oh do not look so surprised i mean with the man you fled with the man wilson i don't know any one called wilson anne he looked at her keenly i implore you to tell me the truth who is this man you fled with to gravesend with whom you went on board the yacht is that known she asked in a terrified whisper yes a great deal is known portia never told me that she murmured to herself who is portia she lives at the priory and-i see she is the red-haired freckled-faced girl the daughter of mr franklin morley told me that portia what a stately name for that dreadful young person but indeed giles she is a good girl and has been a kind friend to me explained anne eagerly she told me all about you and how you believed in my innocence ah exclaimed giles then that was why she seemed so pleased to hear my name i met her in the park just now anne you met her in the park anne half rose to go he drew her down yes dearest but don't be alarmed she will never think that we have met she was looking for this and giles took out the coin anne gave a cry of delighted surprise oh she said taking it eagerly 
i thought i had lost it for ever and you found it giles i found it he replied gravely it was that discovery which made me believe that you were in the neighbourhood and then when olga olga anne looked at him suddenly do you know her very well she is your friend my best friend she loves me like a sister giles could have told her that the sisterly love was not to be trusted but she had so much trouble that he could not find it in his heart to add to her worries besides time was slipping by and as yet he knew nothing of the truth of the matter tell me why you fled with that man he asked giles i will tell you all she replied earnestly but on your part let me hear what is being done about the death of poor daisy it will set my mind at rest you see how i have taken care of her grave dear were i guilty would i do that i never thought you guilty he repeated impatiently how many times have i to say that as many as you can bring your mind to repeat she replied it is sweet to think that you love me so well that you can refuse to believe evil of me in the face of the evidence against me anne anne why did you fly tell me how the case stands against me and what you have discovered she asked in a composed voice and with a visible effort to command her feelings and i shall tell you all that i can as time was precious giles did not lose a moment he plunged into the story of all that had taken place from his interview with mrs parry to the finding of the coin which had first given him his clue to the whereabouts of anne also he touched lightly upon the visit of olga to rickwell but was careful not to allude to her feelings towards him since anne believed the woman to be her friend he wished her to remain in that belief he was not the one to add to her sorrows and even when she was cleared of the charge and became his wife ware determined that he would never speak of olga's treachery for her own sake he knew that the hungarian would be silent anne listened in silence to his recital and when he ended drew a sigh of relief it might have been worse she said i don't see how it could be replied ware bluntly morley will insist that you are guilty and steele thinks so too i must admit that he wavers between you and this man you fled with come now anne tell me all i shall not have much time she said hurriedly i dare not let mr franklin know that i have met you if i am not back in the priory soon he will send portia to look for me you can tell me much in ten minutes who is the man my father she replied in a low voice giles could hardly speak for surprise but your father is dead i thought he was said anne i have believed it these many months but when i saw him in mr morley's library on that night i knew that he still lived but i can't understand how you made such a mistake does morley know she shook her head i managed to restrain myself mr morley knows nothing afterwards i went to the church in the hope of meeting my father he was in church i saw him said giles but tell me how the mistake occurred my father lived in florence and is his name walter franklin that is his real name but he was known in florence as alfred denham you spoke to olga caraxe about him under that name yes because i did not know until lately that his name was walter franklin nor did i know that george franklin who inherits daisy's money was his brother so george franklin is your uncle and portia your cousin yes but let me go on my father lived in florence i was often away from home as i was engaged as a governess i came to england and met olga at the institute i procured an engagement in london it was the one i had before mrs morley engaged me i received news that my father was ill of typhoid fever i hurried at once to florence he not only was dead but he was buried so i was informed by mark dane who is mark dane he was my father's secretary one moment anne your uncle stated that he was the man who lived in florence and that your father being a scamp lived in england on account of walter george resided abroad that is quite true but walter i may speak of my father so for the sake of clearness used to come sometimes to florence george never knew that he was there thinking that he was in london 
i learned all this lately at the time my father and i lived in florence i knew nothing of the relationship between george and walter my father knew that if daisy died his brother would inherit the money and he kept a watch on george so as to see if he would come into the property but i knew nothing of this neither did mark although he was deep in my father's confidence well as i say my father was supposed to have died i expected another corpse was buried in his place mark no doubt agreed to the fraud whatever was the reason but i have not seen mark since immediately after the death and can't get an explanation i saw him in florence and he told me that my father was dead and buried since then i have not seen him so you returned to england thinking your father was dead certainly he left me a little money i went back to my situation afterwards i came down here on that new year's eve i entered the library and saw my father speaking to mr morley i disguised my feelings as i was certain he did not wish to be recognized but the shock was so great that i nearly fainted i went up to my room and afterwards to church to see my father he was there as you know i saw him pass a paper to daisy she went out ten minutes later he followed i wished to see him and i was curious to know why he had come to rickwell and had let me think he was dead shortly afterwards i went outside it was snowing fast i could not see my father or daisy suddenly i came across my father he was beside the grave of mr kent daisy was lying on the ground he gasped out that she was dead and implored me to save him do you think he killed her no afterwards he denied that he did but at the time i believed that he was guilty i saw that he would be arrested and in a frenzy of alarm i cast about for some means to save him i remembered your motor-car was waiting at the gates i sent trim away on an errand i know i know you deceived him to save my father replied anne quietly i got the car in this way and went off with my father he told me to go to gravesend where he had a yacht waiting near gravesend the car upset we left it on the roadside and walked to tilbury a boatman ferried us across the river and we went on board the yacht did you know your father was the owner of the yacht no i did not he said that it belonged to a friend we departed in the yacht and went to a french port then on to paris and it was from paris that you sent me the drawing of the coin yes i knew that appearances were against me and could not bear to think that you should believe me guilty i did not dare to send any letter but i knew you would recognize the drawing of the edward the seventh coin and so sent it as you saw how long did you stay in paris for some weeks then we went to italy to florence wasn't your father recognized no he had altered his appearance he gave me no reason at first for doing this but afterwards told me that he was engaged in a political conspiracy something to do with the anarchists is the red cross the symbol of some society i can't say he refused to explain the mystery of the cross to me i admit fully giles that i cannot understand my father his ways are strange and he leads a most peculiar life afterwards george franklin my uncle came to england and inherited the property my father sent me to him with an explanation my uncle refused to believe that i was guilty and gave me shelter in his house until such time as my character could be cleared i came over and have been hiding in the priory ever since i was so sorry for poor daisy and for her unexpected death that i came to see after her grave i found it neglected and thus went to clean it as you see portia my cousin has been very good to me i have stayed in all day and have walked out in the evening no one knows that i am here no one will ever know unless you tell i tell and what do you take me for i will keep quiet until i can clear your character and make you my wife you must not see me again no sighed giles it will not be wise but can't you tell me who killed daisy and thus clear yourself anne shook her head i wish i could 
but my father declares that he came out to see the girl and found her already dead on the grave face downwards she had been killed during the time he waited behind he saw that there was a danger of his being accused of the crime since he had asked her to leave the church thus it was that he lost presence of mind and called on me to save him i did so on the impulse of the moment and thus it all came about where is your father now anne thought for a moment i would tell you if i knew she said seriously as i know you will not betray him but i don't know where he is since i have been here i have not heard a word from him your uncle if my uncle knew he would hand my father over to the police he hates him but he is always kind to me anne i wonder if your uncle killed daisy to inherit the money no he was in italy at the time i am sure of that has your father any suspicion who killed daisy no he says he has not why did he ask her to leave the church and how did he manage it he wished to speak to her about george franklin who would inherit the money if she died i believe he intended to warn her that george was dangerous for he hates my uncle did your father know that the money had been left at the time no it was only because he was on the spot that he wished to see daisy he wrote on a scrap of paper that he wished to see her about the money and she came out she was always eager after that miserable money said ware sadly but your father did know that powell was dead at the time anne and he told her of his discoveries in connection with the office boy so you see your father was in england masquerading as wilson he finished yes said anne with a shudder i see now but he told me nothing of this indeed i can't understand my father at all do you know the meaning of this guarded cross no he refuses to tell me he won't say why he pretended to be dead and in every way he is most mysterious but i am fond of my father giles although i know he is not a good man but he did not kill daisy i am sure of that and even at the time i thought he had done so i saved him after all he may be as bad as possible but he is my father and i owe him a daughter's affection giles would have argued this but at the moment anne started to her feet she heard the sound of approaching footsteps and without a word to giles she flew over the low wall and darted across the park he was too astonished by the sudden departure to say a word he had lost her again but he knew where she was after all end of chapter seventeen read by celine major chapter eighteen of a coin of edward the seventh this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a coin of edward the seventh by fergus hume chapter eighteen what happened next giles left the churchyard slowly with his brain in a whirl anne had departed in hot haste taking shelter in her hiding-place and he dared not follow unless he wanted it to be discovered he never knew who it was whose footsteps had startled her away when she left him he remained for quite ten minutes where he was in a kind of dazed condition the footsteps were not heard now so intent had he been upon anne's flight and on the amazing things she had told him that he had not noticed when they ceased then it occurred to him that they had retreated just as though a person had been listening and had hastily gone away but of this he could not be sure all he did know was that when he rounded the corner there was not a soul in sight and nothing remained but to go home olga and her mother did not put in an appearance on this night so giles had ample time to think over his meeting with anne he did not see how he could help her and the story she had related bewildered instead of enlightening him after a time he rearranged the details and concluded that in spite of all denial her father was the guilty person and the crime had been committed for the sake of the powell money whether the scarlet cross indicates a political society or is the symbol of a thieves association said giles to himself i can't say until steele is more certain of his ground but this alfred denham or walter franklin or whatever he chooses to call himself is evidently a bad lot he has sufficient love for his daughter to keep his iniquities from her and that is why anne is so much in the dark 
i quite believe that she thinks her father innocent and saved him on the spur of the moment but he is guilty for all that and then giles proceeded to work out the case as it presented itself to him walter franklin as he found it most convenient to call him was a scoundrel who preyed on society and who by some mischance had a pure and good daughter like anne to keep her from knowing how bad he was and the man apparently valued her affection he sent her to be a governess she believed in him not knowing how he was plotting to get the powell money certainly walter had resided in florence under the name of denham ware quite believed this and guessed that he did so in order to keep an eye on his brother george who was to inherit the powell money probably he knew beforehand that powell was ill and so had feigned death that he might carry out his scheme without anne's knowledge that scheme was to impersonate his brother and giles trembled to think of how he proposed to get rid of george when the time was ripe he must have intended to murder him for since he had slain daisy with so little compunction he certainly would not stick at a second crime however thus giles argued the first step to secure the money was for him to feign death and thus get rid of anne then he came to london and as wilson stopped with mrs benker in order to spy on the ashers through alexander as soon as he knew for certain that powell was dead and that the money was coming to daisy he came down to rickwell on the errand of serving the summons and then had lured the girl outside of the church to kill her but for anne following him he would have disappeared into the night and no one would have been the wiser but the appearance of his daughter in the library upset his plans she followed him into the church and came out to find him near the dead body he certainly made an excuse but giles believed that such was a lie if he had confessed to the crime even anne might not have stopped with him but here giles remembered that at the time of the flight anne really believed that her father was guilty at all events he had made use of her to get away and thus had reached the yacht at gravesend it was waiting for him there in order that he might fly after the crime was committed perhaps he intended to walk to tilbury and crossing the thames get on board the yacht before the hue and cry was out anne hampered his plans in some measure and then by means of the stolen motor-car assisted them thus the man had got away and by the murder of the girl had opened the way to george inheriting the money they went to paris mused giles then to florence i dare say this walter intended to send anne away on some excuse and to murder his brother in florence then he could slip into the dead man's shoes and come to inherit as george the property of powell probably george left florence before walter arrived and thus escaped death he is safe so far but how long will he be safe then a terrible thought occurred to giles he wondered if walter had placed his daughter at the priory so as to have an opportunity of coming to see his brother and thus seizing his chance of killing him anne innocent as she was of the real meaning of these terrible schemes might be a decoy if her father came george would be murdered walter who was able to disguise himself with infernal ingenuity might slip into the dead man's shoes and thus the money he had schemed for would come to him evidently the last act of the tragedy was not yet played out the more giles puzzled over the matter the more bewildered he became he could see as he thought what had been done but he could not guess how the last act was to be carried out yet walter franklin was hiding somewhere waiting to pounce out on his unsuspecting brother and the second crime might involve anne still deeper in the nefarious transactions of her father finally giles made up his mind to seek george franklin at the priory and tell him what he thought the man should at least be put on his guard it may be said that ware fancied he might be permitted to see anne as a reward for his kind warning before calling on franklin he went to see the foreign ladies to his surprise both had left by the early morning train there was a note from olga which informed him that her mother had insisted on returning to town finding the country cold and dull the note added that she olga would be glad to see him at the westminster flat as soon as he could come to london and ended with the remark that he had yet to give his answer to her question giles was relieved when he read this olga was gone and the two days of probation were extended indefinitely he might find some way of releasing anne before he need give this dreadful answer 
again and again did he bless the selfishness of the elder princess which had removed the obstacle of olga from his path meanwhile he put her out of his mind and went on to the priory he called in on the way to see morley but learned that the little man had gone to town mrs morley looked more worn and haggard than ever and seemed about to say something as giles was taking his leave however she held her peace and merely informed him that she missed her children dreadfully but i'm sure that is not what she meant to say thought ware as he departed on looking back he saw her thin white face at the window and concluded as mrs perry did that the poor lady had something on her mind in due time he arrived at the priory and was shown into a gloomy drawing-room where george franklin received him giles apologized for not having called before and was graciously pardoned and indeed i should have called on you mr ware said franklin but i am such a recluse that i rarely go out you call on mr morley i believe yes he is a cheery man and won't take no for an answer i find that his company does me good but i prefer to be alone with my books there were many books in the room and many loose papers on the desk which giles saw were manuscripts i write sometimes said franklin smiling in his sour way it distracts my mind from worries i am writing a history of florence during the age of the renaissance a very interesting period giles assured him yes and my daughter portia helps me a great deal you have met her mr ware she told me yes we met in the park she was looking for something which i found but i gave it to-to giles hesitated for he was on dangerous ground to another lady he finished desperately and waited for the storm to break to his surprise the man smiled you mean my niece anne said he in the calmest way yes i do mean miss denham but i did not know that-that that i wished you to know she was under my roof is that it yes stammered giles quite at sea he did not expect this candour franklin rather enjoyed his confusion i did not intend to let you know that she was here it was her own request that you were kept in ignorance but since you met her did you hear of our meeting certainly anne told me of it directly she came back oh i have heard all about you mr ware my niece confessed that you loved her and from morley i heard that you defended her did morley know that anne was here certainly not at the outset of our acquaintance he informed me that he believed her to be guilty i resolved to say nothing lest he might tell the police why did you not tell him that she was innocent asked giles hotly the man looked grave and smoothed his shaven chin a habit with him when perplexed because i could not do so without telling an untruth he said coldly giles started to his feet blazing with anger what he cried can you sit there and tell me that your own niece killed that poor girl i have reason to believe that she did replied franklin she told me she was innocent began ware franklin interrupted she loves you too well to say otherwise but she is guilty i would not believe that if she told me herself sit down mr ware said franklin after a pause i'll explain exactly how the confession came about giles took his seat again and eyed his host pale but defiant it is no use your saying anything against anne she is innocent mr ware i believed that when she first came to me i hate my brother because he is a bad man but i liked his niece and when she came to me for shelter i took her in notwithstanding the enormity of the crime which she was accused of having committed it gained you your fortune said ware bitterly i would rather have been without a fortune gained at such a price answered franklin coldly but i really believed anne guiltless she defended her father but i fancied since she had helped him to escape that he had killed the poor girl and he did cried giles i am sure he did he had no motive oh yes to get the money the five thousand a year you forget by miss kent's death that came to me your brother would have found means to get it i believe he will find means yet i don't understand you will you explain franklin seemed fairly puzzled by giles remarks so the young man set forth the theory he had formed about the murder at first mr franklin smiled satirically 
but after a time his face became grave and he seemed agitated when giles ended he walked the room in a state of subdued irritation what have i done to be so troubled with such a relative as walter he said aloud i believe you are right mr ware he may attempt my life to get the money and as we are rather alike one another in appearance he may be able to pass himself off as me why there was a woman here who called herself mrs benker she insisted that i was called wilson under which name she knew my brother walter so you must see how easily it could impose on every one i am dark and clean-shaven he is red-haired and bearded but a razor and a pot of black dye would soon put that to rights yes he might attempt my murder but do not let us saddle him with a crime of which he is guiltless anne killed the girl i assure you this is the truth i don't believe it cried giles fiercely nevertheless franklin paused and then came forward swiftly to place a sympathetic hand on the young man's shoulder i heard her say so myself she confessed to me that she had met you and seemed much agitated then she ran out of this room to another fearing she was ill i followed and found her on her knees praying she said aloud that she had deceived you stating that she could not bear to lose your love by proclaiming herself a murderess no no i won't listen giles closed his ears be a man mr ware anne is ill now she confessed the truth to me and then fled to her bedroom this morning she was very ill as my daughter portia assured me portia is out of the house if you will come with me you will hear the truth from anne herself she is so ill that she will not try to deceive you now but if she does confess you must promise not to give her up to the police she is suffering agonies poor child i'll come at once said giles bravely starting to his feet and it was brave of him for he dreaded the truth if she confesses this i'll go away and never see her again the police ah you needn't think i would give her up to the police but if she is guilty and i can't believe such a thing of her i'll tear her out of my heart but it's impossible impossible franklin looked at him with a pitying smile as he hid his face in his hands then he touched him on the shoulder and led the way along a passage towards the back part of the house at a door at the end he paused the room is rather dark you won't see her clearly he said but you will know her by her voice i would know her anyway cried giles fiercely and tormented beyond endurance franklin gave him another glance as though asking him to brace himself for the ordeal and then opened the door he showed small mercy in announcing ware's coming anne here is mr ware come to see you tell him the truth the room was not very large and was enveloped in a semi-gloom the blind was pulled down and the curtains were drawn the bed was near the window and on it lay anne in a white dress she was lying on the bed with a rug thrown over her feet when she heard the name of giles she uttered a cry keep him away she said harshly keep him away don't let him come anne anne cried giles coming forward his mouth dry his hands clenched do not tell me that you killed daisy there was a groan and silence but anne so far as he could see buried her face in the pillow it was franklin who spoke anne you must tell the truth once and for all no no she cried giles would despise me anne he cried in agony did you kill her yes came the muffled voice from the bed i found her at the grave my father was not there he had missed her in the darkness and the snow she taunted me i had the stiletto which i took from the library and i killed her it was my father who saved me oh go away giles go away but giles did not go he rose to his feet and stepped towards the window in a second he had the blind up and the curtains drawn apart the light poured into the room to reveal not anne denham but the girl portia franklin end of chapter eighteen read by celine major